Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Mesopotamia in the second millennia BC in our continuing survey of ancient history as a framework for the Bible. Some of the places that we've already noted, we spoke of Sumer back when we were speaking of Mesopotamia, the Sumerian culture and civilization in southern Mesopotamia. Um, Assyria, very early in that history, uh, we have Assyria, but we're going to see them uh, continuing to exist and even to have their ups and downs. Uh, we have Elam to the east of Mesopotamia in the Zagros Mountains to the east. Uh, Aram, um, they seem to come into, uh, into power much later. Uh, although there are hints that they are there already with their capital city of Damascus and uh, eventually their language is going to win out even though they will not be a major ruling power their language is going to have a great influence and Aramaic will be the lingua franca that is the common language of the ancient world by the first millennia BC uh, Egypt of course uh, down along the banks of the Nile River and then another people group we haven't talked about much, and we're going to get to this time, and that is the Hittites who live along the banks of the Halys River in central Anatolia. Now, the Akkadian period, and we spoke of this uh, back when we were speaking of Mesopotamia, uh, around 2330 BC, we have Sargon the Great, who manages to unify central Mesopotamia um, but his, um, his empire, if we can be so bold as to call it that, comes to an end with the Guti invasion, the Guti from the Zagros Mountains to the east. And this is going to give way, once the Guti are driven out, to the third dynasty of Ur, who will rule over southern Mesopotamia. Uh, it's a Sumerian dynasty, uh, and the city of Ur will, will rise to prominence. Um, and it's during this period that we have Abram uh, leaving Ur of the Chaldees. Now, the term Chaldees isn't going to be used until much later. It's sort of an, an anachronism. It's like us speaking today of New York City, which is it's called that today. But originally, New York City wasn't called New York City. It was called New Amsterdam. Well, likewise, Ur of the Chaldees wasn't originally called Ur of the Chaldees. It was just called Ur. So that's, that seems to be a later description that's put on it. But Abram leaves, the, leaves uh, Ur around this time, um, around near the end of the third dynasty of Ur. Not only does Abraham move at this time, but around 2000 BC, we have a number of people groups uh, moving in various directions. Uh, we have a people group moving down from uh, Europe into into Greece, and we're going to have, after this established, the Mycenaean civilization. We have another people group that move uh, into Anatolia and um, are going to uh, uh, join with uh, the people there, and they will become the Hittite civilization. So it's, it's going to be an amalgamation of, of several different peoples. Likewise, the ha we have the Amorites moving from um, the Levant into Mesopotamia. And finally, um, first we saw Guti, and now we're going to see the Elamite invasion, uh, which will bring uh, Ur crashing down. And so all of these, you know, around 2000 BC, we have the entire Middle Eastern world in sort of a state of movement and flux. And it's around that time that we see Abraham also moving <laughs> Um, notice he's, he, you know, the Amorites are coming one way, he's going the other way, and he's moving to Haran and eventually down into the land of Canaan. Now, from 2000 to 1800 BC, we have the Isin Larsa period. Notice I've got two different cities, Isin and Larsa. And the reason we call it that is because neither one really has the supremacy. Uh, instead, we have a period of city states that are ruling. Um, and so uh, both these, these are two of the prominent ones in southern Mesopotamia, but also toward the end of this period, we have Assyria growing, and for a time, looks like they're going to be an empire uh, as they exercise their, their dominance over most of Mesopotamia, even marching all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. Now, 
um, that doesn't last past uh, one particular family. And when the Assyrian Empire shrinks back, there we're going to see them uh, growing, and then the king dies, and he it, it becomes small again. In that vacuum, we have one particular king, uh, the king of Babylon by the name of Hammurabi. He dies in 750 BC, but before he dies, uh, we're going to see him. Uh, he succeeds his father as the king of Babylon, and uh, they've been under Assyrian dominance, but he throws that off, and he not only drives out the Assyrians, dri also drives out the Elamites, and manages to unite all the lands of central and southern Mesopotamia under his rule. So we have Hammurabi uniting Mesopotamia, at least the southern and central portions of that land. Uh, it's interesting that for, you know, for all his name recognition, uh, he seems to have a, a problem with delegation. Uh, there's, there's little in the way of delegating authority. Um, instead, we have Hammurabi insisting that he makes all the decisions for everything. Uh, and of course, um, you have to have a great deal of energy to keep up with something like that. Uh, and it will also not long last after his death. The Code of Hammurabi is of interest to us because of some of its re resemblances to the Mosaic Law, which it predates. Uh, it goes back to 1750 BC. We're not going to see um, the Israelites coming out of Egypt until around 1440 BC, some 300 years later. Uh, this uh, code is found on a stella, a stone that was found at Susa by de Morgan in 1902. It had quite a um, a interesting voyage back to England was was caught in a storm and almost sank, but it did survive to make it to the um, the British Museum in in London. Uh, it describes a caste system that is in place where you have uh, the nobility and then you have the I guess you could call them the merchants and the 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 workers and then you have the slaves and though you know where you were in that system you were. <laughs> I can use the term, you were actually set in stone. Um, there also is in this code system what we call lex talionis, that is a, you know, sort of the, the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, you know, the punishment fits the crime um, very exactly. Uh, wages are set also as we, as we uh, use the pun, set in stone, um, where they are decreed, this is, you know, what a certain thing costs, and, and there was no changing of that. Uh, there was a trial by ordeal where you might be taken and either cast into a fire or thrown into the river. That, that was a more common uh, means. And if you, if you sank or floated, that would determine your innocence and or guilt. Um, the Code of Hammurabi detailed marriage laws. That, they, that a marriage was only legal when it had been put into writing. Now, not everyone could write, so this necessitated the use of a scribe if you wanted to be legally married. Uh, the penalty for adultery is death, but uh, also wives were allowed to own property. So uh, women had some, they had some rights uh, under the Code of Hammurabi. It did specify monogamy, that is, you were only supposed to have one wife. Now, the Assyrian kingdom comes up after, uh, after Hammurabi, and the Assyrians are able to assert their independence. Uh, they make treaties with the surrounding city-states. Um, and Babylon, after this, is going to begin to descend, not into obscurity, but it will no longer be a chief city as it had been under Hammurabi. Another kingdom that we see, and a city that it, uh, we see as its capital, is the city of Mari on the Euphrates, uh, in the neighborhood of the Assyrian kingdom. The Mari tablets were excavated by André Parot 
uh, from 1933 to 1938. Again, he went back in 1952. This was after the after World War II uh, and excavated until 1956. Uh, and more than 20,000 tablets were discovered at Mari. They present life in among the Akkadians. They're written in Akkadian from 1800 to 1750 BC. So this is just uh, within the scope of Hammurabi's reign. Uh, and it includes some interesting biblical names, like the name Abraham, like the name Jacob. Now, that's not saying that it's the same Abraham or the same Jacob, you know, different people, but those names are reflected within this culture. It also uh, paints a picture of travel and commerce. For example, one of the tablets was a, r a tablet indicating uh, a rental lease where somebody was renting a wagon and uh, listed in there was the requirement you could not take the wagon to the Mediterranean, which indicates that people were in that day traveling to the Mediterranean and back, and, and there was uh, considerable travel taking place. Um, we also see a reference to a covenant, and the, the formula that is used is being described to kill a young donkey in other words, to make, a, to make or to cut a covenant. Um, so that that, uh, that idea of making a covenant by killing an animal, uh, that was described here uh, within the Mari tablets. Now, another city that we see, and it's not an important city except for us, because it reflects some uh, more light upon the culture of that day, and that is the city of Nuzi. The Nuzi tablets came from this much smaller town. It was always under the shadow of either uh, Mari or it was under the shadow of the Assyrians. Uh, it was always under somebody else's authority, but it's a smaller town, destroyed around 1450 BC, and it reflects many of the customs and the culture that are similar to that of the patriarchs in Genesis. For example, the idea when we read it of Sarai taking her handmaiden and giving her uh, to Abraham to have a son by her, that's reflected in the Nuzi tablets, where under the Nuzi tablets, that was the law, where a wife who was barren and could not have children, she was required to give to her husband a slave or handmaiden or, or something on that note by which they could by which she could have a, a heir and a son. Now let's talk about the Hittites. The Hittites uh, they're up in the area of, of Anatolia where we have the bend in the great Halys River that cuts through that land. They come and conquer Babylon in the 1600s. They don't, they don't come and stay. Um, uh, this is a bit after Hammurabi's time. They come and conquer, probably just to, say that, you know, to be able to say that they had done it. Um, and after this, we're going to have the Kassite dynasty that arises in Babylon. And they're going to rule for 300 years. Uh, from 1500 to 1200 BC, uh, the Kassites will rule and will bring quite a measure of stability to the land during their period. If you had looked at the uh, French Encyclopedia uh, under the Hittites back in 1870, 1871, uh, the entire uh, some of knowledge about the Hittites was reflected in this passage, uh, describing it as a Canaanite tribe encountered in Palestine by the Israelites, resident and alongside the Amorites in the region of Bethel. They were pressed into service by Solomon. Still later, however, an independent and monarchically governed Hittite tribe existed near Syria. And that's all that anybody knew about the Hittites. In other words, whatever was in the Bible, that's all that they knew about that. And yet, the Bible itself describes something that was a bit more than that. There's a story that's told where God used the sound, a certain sound, to deliver the people of Israel. Where a certain city had been surrounded by, uh, by the Arameans, and the Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots 
and the sound of horses, even the sound of a great army. So they said to one of them, now they heard the sound of an army coming, and they, they thought, oh my goodness, behold, the king of Israel has hired against us, and notice what's, what it says here, the king of the Hittites, the kings of the Hittites, and the kings of the Egyptians. You know, usually you put the greater king first, but they thought, the kings of the Hittites, oh yeah, and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Because they associated the sounds of horses and a great army with the Hittites and the Egyptians. And as a result, they fled in twilight, left their tents, their, their horses, their donkeys, even the camp, and, and, and the story goes on from there. But there is this hint within the biblical text that not only Egypt, but the Hittites were a great warrior culture. Well, the land of Hatti, as I said, back in the 1800s, we did not know anything about that, the land of the Hittites. And it was left to a explorer by the name of Charles Texier. He was traveling through Turkey in 1834, and he was searching for a lost Roman city, the Roman city of Tavium, and he thought it might be in this area, in the area of a place, a village called Bogaz Kui. Uh, and he came to Bogaz Kui, and he was out for a walk, uh, and he came upon a giant stone wall with heavy uh, megalithic stones. You know, it certainly wasn't Roman. Uh, at first he thought, gee, maybe I've, I've discovered Tavium. Uh, it wasn't. It was some unknown ruins some unknown ruins, and he, he came, uh, walked along this wall, and he found a great gate with the statues of two lions. Certainly nothing Roman about this. There were images of chariots and horses and warriors. And the name of the place they came to found as they began to do excavations here, the name Hatasus. It was a people that he'd never seen. They looked both, they, they were Indo-European in stock. And it was a uh, man by the name of Archibald Sace who visited the site in 1789 and suggested that perhaps these were the biblical Hittites. And nobody agreed with him at the time. In fact, he was, he was virtually ignored in his suggestion. But Hugo Winkler uh, made two expeditions to that site in the early 1900s. And Winkler would hire local natives to bring him fragments of tablets. He would sit in his tent uh, taking these fragments and piecing them together. And they would piece together quite remarkably well. And he would be able to, to sort of uh, assemble an entire tablet. And then he would translate it. And then he'd take the, the next number of pieces and piece them together. His assistant began to grow uh, curious as to where the natives might be getting these fragments of tablets. And early one morning, he followed one of the workers with his wheelbarrow up into the hills, uh, came to some ruins, and there uh, in an open space, there were literally hundreds of perfectly preserved tablets. And, and this native you know, pulled out you know, th four or five of them, uh, used his pickaxe to break them into pieces, threw them in his wheelbarrow, and then brought them down to Winkler, who was busily assembling his tablets. <laughs> uh, Archaeology, as you can see back then, was not in its present form. It was rather haphazard. And the amazing thing was that they were able to find as much as they were. One of the things that they found was an Akkadian tablet. It's on display today at the um, Istanbul Antiquities Museum, containing a treaty between Ramses II and Hattasulis, the king of the Hittites. The Hittites have left us a picture of a great and mighty empire that ruled for hundreds of years, and yet when it would fall, would be eventually forgotten by the Western world. Another kingdom we want to talk about is the kingdom of Mitanni, located in northern Mesopotamia, mostly along the banks of the Euphrates, although for parts of their, uh, parts of their reign, uh, they're, go they're going to get much bigger than that. Uh, they're known as the Bible as the Hurrians. Uh, 
And uh, it, it's under their shadow that we see the Kassite dynasty in Babylon. We mentioned that's going to, to reign for 300 years. Mitanni suffers its first blow at the hands of Thutmose III of Egypt during the 18th dynasty, who makes 17 different campaigns up to the Euphrates River. When he's doing that, the kingdom that he's attacking is the kingdom of Mitanni, and he, he comes close to shattering it, uh, although, although they do s survive his attacks. And his son, although he starts, uh, the son of Thutmose III, uh, starts to do the same thing, yet something else takes place in his reign that will short-circuit that. It's at that time, it, during the reign of Amenhotep II, that we have the Israelite exodus from Egypt going down to Mount Sinai. Uh, eventually they seek to go into the Promised Land. Remember, they, uh, they are repulsed, uh, uh, the story with the Twelve Spies. Uh, and after wandering in the wilderness, for 40 years, they eventually do come into the Promised Land, but we have uh, Israel taking the Promised Land in the middle of a time when there are these great kingdoms of Egypt and the Hittites and Mitanni all surrounding them. The question, if you had been living at that time, is will this tiny kingdom of Israel survive? Part of the offset begins is when the Hittites attack Mitanni and they batter this, this kingdom to the point of non-existence. It's around this time that we have the city of Ugarit. Now Ugarit is another forgotten city. Uh, it was discovered by a farmer on his field in, in 1928. Uh, he was plowing his field, and uh, there was a big rock in the field, and so he tried to, to move the rock out of the way. He moved the rock out of the way, and beneath it was a big cave. Um, and he said, goodness, what's this doing? And he sh shone a light down there. There were tablets in a scene below. Archaeologists came. I'm not sure what it did to the man's farming ability. But a, but a large city was discovered here at Ugarit, Royal palaces, uh, a royal palace with 90 different rooms. Uh, there were two temples that were discovered. Uh, one to Baal, son of El. The other was to Dagon, both familiar names in our biblical text. Uh, and tablets dating to, from 1450 to about 1200 BC. Uh, that is from the time of the Exodus to the time, or to within the time of the book of Judges. Uh, these tablets had, they used, made use of an alphabet that looked like cuneiform, but instead of cuneiform, it, it, it indeed was an alphabet. Uh, and they reflected a Semitic language that was related to Hebrew. In fact, it has helped our understanding of Hebrew to read Ugarit. The Ugaritic poetry uses figures of speech that are similar to the Hebrew poets. And so this is helped us both to understand the Bible, as well as using the Bible, to understand the Ugaritic language. Uh, included in these finds were a Mycenaean ivory box lid uh, that reflects the fact that there was trade and commerce going on uh, through these people. There was travel going back and forth from Greece to Ugarit, uh, to Egypt, to the Hittites, uh, it became one of the, um, I guess we could call it a crossroads. During the en toward the end of the 18th dynasty, a letter was written by the princess, she had been the uh, wife of our famous Tutankhamun, who had died in, as a late teenager, uh, Ankhesen Pa Aten, uh, she writes a letter to the king of the Hittites, to Supi Luliama, uh, saying, My husband, and she's speaking of, of Tutankhamun, My husband has died, and I have no son. They say about you that you have many sons. You might give me one of your sons to become my husband. I would not wish to take one of my subjects as a husband. And so she writes to the king of the Hittites, saying, Look, send him one of your sons. He'll come down and be the new pharaoh. He'll be my consort. He'll be my husband. And presumably, the husband was sent down. 
However, he was ambushed on the way. He was put to death. And also, Ankhesen Pa'aten uh, was put to death. And this marks the end of the 18th dynasty of Egypt as a new dynasty asserts itself to power. The 19th dynasty would soon find itself at odds with the Hittites, as both Ramses II and Muatala uh, II uh, clash at a place called Kadesh. On the Orontes River, uh, Ramses had, was marching north with his army. This is Ramses II known, well, at least by himself, as Ramses the Great. And on his way, he had received a false report uh, to supposed um, deserters from the Hittite army uh, were quote-unquote caught by him. They allowed themselves to be caught. And they told him, uh, the Hittite king has heard of the great power of your coming and he's running away he's 100 miles to the north and he's just running really fast all the way home and if you hurry you might be able to catch him and Ramses believed the report Ramses set off in pursuit um, he, he sort of um, you know moved up the timetable and he was with his I guess we can call it his Ammon division uh, and he set, he moved up to a place northwest of the city of Kadesh, not realizing the Hittites were lying in wait just on the other side of the city. Um, and this caused his forces to be strung out because they had to, to cross the Orontes River and it, uh, at a place where it was fordable, and it was taking some time to do that. Uh, so uh, the Amman division set up camp northwest of the city of Kadesh. Meanwhile, the raid division was, was trying to catch up in the Ta and the Set divisions. They were, you know, far in the south. And as the raid division was coming up, the Hittites attacked across the Orontes River with your chariot corps. They quickly put to flight the Egyptians, shattering that Ra division, and then they moved north to attack Ramses in his camp, uh, the Ammon division. And the Egyptians suddenly found themselves not ready, not prepared, and with an entire army of Hittites closing down upon them. It's at this point that Ramses tells us, and we are looking and reading this from uh, his monument at Abu Sembel, um, far to the south of Egypt uh, on, the, on the banks of the Nile River. Uh, Ramses says, uh, like a crocodile, I became angry. I was surrounded by, by the, you know, I was being attacked by the Hittites. And I jumped into my chariot and I surrounded them and I chopped at them. And to, to hear Ramses tell the story, he single-handedly defeated the Hittites. Which is something that we would believe if that was the only account that we had. Fortunately, today, we have the account from the Hittites, from their side of the story. And what they tell us is, you know, the same part that we all already described, but that as the Hittites uh, uh, swept into the Egyptian camp, they saw the camp filled with all sorts of treasures and gold and silver and things like that, and they stopped to loot it. Meanwhile, the Egyptians had a chance to conduct a quick counterattack, which allowed them to escape. Uh, Ramses took his army, what was left of it, back to Egypt, pulled all the, um, patched up all the arrow holes out of his chariot, and announced to his fellow Egyptians that he had won the war, and that he was the victorious conqueror. Uh, however, Ramses never again set foot out of Egypt, for, and he's going to reign a very, very long time after this, always talking about the great battle that he had fought at Kadesh, but not eager to go for a repeat performance. Let's turn our attention now to the Minoans on the island of Crete to the south of Greece. The Minoan civilization was discovered by Arthur Evans, who began excavations in Crete in the year 1900. Uh, he excavated ruins at Knossos, 
And he labeled that which he found, he labeled that culture Minoan after the legendary King of Minos. Now, they never called themselves Minoans. That is a modern designation. But what he found were wonderfully ornate palaces, a, a palace without any kind of city walls around it because the Minoans were such an advanced people and were in, in such control over their part of the Mediterranean that they could live in a land of unwalled cities, at least uh, early in their career. Um, among the finds, they, we find a number of, of depictions of, um, what well, I guess you could call them bull leapers, acrobats uh, that are uh, jumping over bulls. Here's another such uh, picture. Uh, we wonder, did this have religious significance, or was this just the, uh, the ancient equivalent uh, of the Midwest rodeo? One of their outline colonies was in Santorini. They had colonies all over the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, Santorini is of particular interest because what you're looking at here is the mouth, now most of it's underwater, the mouth of a giant volcano that erupted in the second millennia BC. Uh, perhaps giving rise to legends of a great land with great cities that sank beneath the sea in a single day. Of course, what I'm talking about is the Atlantis legends that were related by Plato. He said that he had gotten the story uh, third hand from, from some Egyptian priests, and Egyptian priests are notoriously ignorant when it comes to geography, because anything outside of Egypt is just out there. And so they may have gotten the exact place uh, wrong, but what they seem to describe sounds an awful lot like the Minoan culture uh, and the Minoan colony on Santorini. Now, while Evans was uh, conducting his excavations in Crete, uh, just prior to him, we have Heinrich Schoelemann, who excavated both Mycenae and Troy. This is the Lion's Gate at Mycenae. Um, we described Crete as a, having palaces and cities without walls. By contrast, the Mycenaeans had these great megalithic walls, you know, large stones uh, making up the walls, and here is the Lion's Gate. Um, just down the hill, they, they found tombs that are going to be reminiscent of tombs that we find uh, along the Levant at places like Ebla. As we look at the ornate, and these are, are uh, ceremonial swords and or knives uh, with, with graphic representations of hunting scenes, of nature, of just uh, wonderful and delightful patterns. Now, in 1200 BC, things are going to change in a big way as we have migrations coming down from Egypt and bringing destruction, overthrowing the Mycenaean civilization. We're not going to see a civilization, civilization in its place. Uh, there are places where the cities are destroyed, other places where the cities are just hurriedly abandoned. This crosses over into Crete, where the, uh, the final gasp of the Minoan civilization also disappears. Even to this day, we have legends of the fall of Troy, and that happens again at this time, with invaders coming across the Aegean, and then moving across Anatolia to bring the Hittite civilization to a close. We will see Hittites after this, but not as a unified kingdom. They will be splintered into small city-states, and then even those will gradually disappear. We will still have Hittites, for example, uh, when we read in the Bible, one of one of David's men was Uriah the Hittite. But in his day, the Hittite civilization was a thing of the past. There will also be the Sea Peoples who come down and try to invade Egypt. They will be repulsed by Ramses III of the 19th dynasty of Egypt. But if
few of them will be allowed to settle on the uh, on the southern shores of the Levant near the area of Canaan and they will give rise to the Philistines. It has been noted that the Philistines and the Mycenaeans share a great deal of common heritage. And one has to ask, when we read the story of David and Goliath, is it possible that Goliath's grandfather or great-grandfather had fought at the Battle of Troy?